So welcome everybody to another episode of the Solar Journey. And uh, today our guest is Pierre Verlinden. He's the terawatt man in the solar industry. Welcome, Pierre. <laughs> Hello, Torsten. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah so we thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So we just met in person. Um, that's week before last week, Silicon PV conference in, uh, in Germany, in Constance, Southern Germany. And uh, many, many people were happy to uh, meet finally again face to face. And uh, we also had the chance to, to uh, uh, see each other face to face, along with many, many other people uh, who I missed to see. I guess it was similar for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great to, to meet again at the conference and see people that you haven't seen for two or three years. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, before we get started, I um, try at least to mention the, the most important highlights because uh, Pierre has been in the industry for such a long time, 40 years at least. And uh, he, has, uh, he has been there when solar was a negligible source of energy and he, yeah, he contributed with uh, lots of technological advancements with 200 technical papers, many, many patents um, to where solar technology is today. So uh, today, um, Pierre Fellin is a managing director of AMROC. That's a PV technology consulting company. It's a one-man show. You'll we'll talk about it uh, sooner, what you do. Yeah. So you have uh, assignments with various industrial um, players in the industry. You, at the same time, are a professor at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia, and at the Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou, China. And um, that already outlines um, that you are playing on all continents, on the relevant PV continents. Um, um, yeah, you um, were, uh, you, now you still are a part-time chief scientist at uh, vice president and uh, at Trina Solar, one of the top 10 uh, solar cell producers. You were that also as a full-time- not, not vice president, I'm, I'm uh, part-time chief scientist. Chief so scientist. correct. Okay, ah, yeah, vice president of the, the okay of the state key laboratory of PV science and technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, you were also um, chief scientist in various other PV companies in the US and Australia, and that includes Sun Power. Actually, you were one of the among the first six, I think, original employees yeah. of Sun Power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. All technology. Um, People in PV know what SunPower is. That's uh, a US American company um, who uh, used to have the most efficient solar cell in the, uh, with a back contact solar cell, very famous back then with uh, Dick Swanson. Um, you are a, uh, on the board of Oxford PV, a tandem perovskite tandem cell manufacturer. Um, and you're also on the board as independent director at BT Imaging, a uh, metrology company from Australia. Um, for your, your, your work is, uh, was awarded with uh, basically the most, most famous, most important uh, awards you can get in, on this planet. Um, <laughs> um, it is like that. So you got the, the William Cherry Award from the uh, IEEE. Um, association in the US. Um, that's the highest award, I would say, for PV scientists uh, that the this organization can hand out. And the you also got the equivalent prize from the European uh, Union, the Becquerel Prize. And uh, you also get got the uh, the uh, the Friendship Award by the Chinese government. And that's the award for the, the highest award given to, uh, to a foreigner by China, also for your achievements in, uh, in PV technology. Yeah. Um, I think- well, Thank you very much, Torsten. I, I, I feel very proud of, of uh, what I've done, but also very humble because, uh, um, I know a lot of people who 
deserve those prizes as much as I do, uh, or probably even more than I do. And uh, I feel very humble about that. Um, it's very difficult because those prizes you get, there's one chance every year and there are so many people who deserve it. So um, uh, I feel very humble about it. Yeah. And um, I, I'm grateful of all the people who worked with me, very smart people. And I had the chance to, to work with, uh, with wonderful leaders like Dick Swanson and, uh, um, and other ones. Uh, I, I really feel very grateful about that. Yeah. Yeah, that just speaks for you, um, that you uh, consider this aspect. Um, but yeah, but you don't, you don't give it, get it by chance or um, for not no. doing great work. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, so 40 years in TV, um, a long time ago, you got started yeah. in TV. Why did, you, why did you move in the solar space in the, in the first place? Well, I, I made my first solar sales in 1978. It was, 1978. Uh, some, okay. Yeah, it was something like 16 percent. Uh, uh, it was probably a very expensive uh, <laughs> uh, solar cells made by hand in a uh, university lab with iron implanters and things like that. So, um, and photoreadography and um, on two inch wafers. <laughs> yeah. Um, why did I start in? Um, uh, in PV, I think um, I, it comes from a very, very long time when I was kids. So I was always uh, dreaming to uh, to make uh, to produce electricity on my own with different systems, and I, I was building little um, generators, or I was uh, trying to invent, trying to imagine a, a roof with. Uh, with thermocouples, thousands of thermocouples to produce electricity and the efficiency would have been probably half a percent or something like that. But yeah. uh, at that time, uh, I had no idea what uh, efficiency would be. Um, and one day I read an article about solar cell and, and I thought that is so cool. <laughs> Absolutely so cool. And I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I think I was, I don't know, 16 or 17 or something like that. Yeah. And um, so I start uh, studying engineering and I went immediately into electrical engineering. And um, when I had to decide about my um, uh, master degree thesis, I decided to, uh, um, to make solar cells. And I made, that's how I made my first solar cells in last year of engineering. Yeah. In, where was that? That was in Leuven? At the University of Louvain, Belgium, yeah, yeah. Catholic University of Louvain. And it, uh, I was in the um, microelectronic laboratory. I yeah. was practically the only one interested in, uh, in making solar cells. Um, there were uh, three other guys who were um, students from Algeria, and they were interested in making solar cells. So we were uh, four of us, and um, they... Very quickly, my colleagues from Algeria left and returned to their country, and I was the only one practically in microelectronics um, doing solar cells. And everybody looked at me and saying, uh, "I should starting to do something serious and making integrated circuits and work on CMOS instead of uh, stupid solar cells that will yeah. not go anywhere." Wow! So uh, great vision already back then. Um, you, uh, phenomenal. So so. Is it correct to say that you're the kind of the, uh, let's see, ideal uh, kind of founder of the today PV uh, lab laboratory with an IMEC? Um, no, 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 no. IMEC is uh, uh, is linked to the uh, the Flemish part of the Catholic University of Louvain. I was in the French side, okay. So yeah. I was not uh, <laughs> uh, involved with IMEC. So I I worked in IMEC. Uh, a couple years as a consultant, okay. uh, but not I've never been a part of IMEC as an employee or founder or or anything like that. Uh, interestingly, uh, I was very interested in high efficiency, so I was developing high efficiency monocrystalline solar cells, and um, I was the application was concentrator, so concentrating PV. Mm -hmm. 
uh, whereas IMEC had uh, uh, following Van Over, uh, Roger Van Overstraat, and who was the founder of uh, IMEC, a, a great man uh, who pushed uh, uh, PV, uh, was a, a big fanatic of uh, photovoltaics in Europe. Okay, uh, he was actually the first uh, um, recipient of the Becquerel Prize. I don't know if you remember. Um, so Roger Van Overstraat and had taken the uh, the road of multi-crystalline, low-cost solar cells with screen-printed process. Um, and I decided that, that that was not the way to go. I decided that the, the way to go was using monocrystalline and, and targeting high efficiency because my vision was that you develop high efficiency cells first, and then you find a way to reduce the cost. Yeah. If you go the other way, you you target low cost first and try to raise the efficiency, basically you close the roads towards high efficiency. You okay. find a way that, that you end up in a cul-de-sac. <laughs> you cannot increase the efficiency anymore. Right. That's what I, I decided to do the other way around. And it was kind of unique in Europe because in Europe, uh, there was no research money for high efficiency solar cells. Okay. There was research money for tin films and uh, and low cost uh, manufacturing, but not for high efficiency, and definitely not for concentrators. Yeah. Um, and that's how I end up um, uh, meeting Dick Swanson in US and decide to work with with Dick on high efficiency solar cells. I was already working on IBC cells in 1978 uh, uh, because I. I found uh, an article from um, uh, for, from Lamert and Schwartz uh, about IBC in that they wrote in 1977 in electron device transaction on electron device, and I thought that was a very very cool uh, device, and okay. I decided to work on that. That's how I met Dick Swanson. So we were discussing about IBC cell at a conference in the IEEE PVSC conference. Yeah, and. Uh, and we worked together after that. So that's when he hired you for SunPower? Well, I first uh, uh, went to Stanford University uh, on a postdoc. Okay. Um, so I, I got a, a, a grant from from NATO, actually. I'm, uh, <laughs> not the military side, but the scientific okay. side. <laughs> so I, I got the, a, a NATO research fellowship to go to Stanford as a visiting, visiting scholar. Um, and I, I worked at Stanford for one year with, uh, with Dick Swanson and Ron Sinton and uh, Dave Kane, et cetera. And, um, uh, and after that year at Stanford, I returned to Louvain where I, I became an assistant professor. Um, but um, what, two years later, three years later, Dick Swanson called me and says, I'm starting SunPower. Do you want to come back? And, and, said, and that yeah. was when? That was then 1982? That was 91. So, he, yeah, so Hang I on. was at Stanford in 1987. Yeah. And um, Dick okay. already had the company under the name of EOS. Uh -huh. The SunPower was called EOS and was actually founded in 1985, but it was a, a paper company for uh, about five years. And um, when uh, I left Stanford um, talking with Dick, um, he knew already that I was interested to come back see if in, in, in case he, he really started the company right. and he needed some people. So uh, when he got some uh, VC funding, he called me back uh, in 1990 and he said, Pierre, do you want to come back to California? I said, yes. All right. That was a great decision. I do not regret that. That was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so, so what's the efficiency at this level? Um, so you started at sixteen percent of your first solar cell. Then uh, when you sixteen percent, yeah. Um, <laughs> then uh, raised okay. to about twenty twenty one already. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 IBC. Um, although I'm not, I'm not totally sure about the measurements at that moment. It was not very <laughs> precise because. Uh, <laughs> the, the spectrum was not right, etc. But uh, anyway, and then um, at Stanford, we were working on, on IBC cells mm. and um, Runcington made a, a first cell of 28%, 28.3% under concentration. 
Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Under consultation. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is not on the the record table because it's, it's disputed by um, uh, by some people because <laughs> the spectrum has been readjusted, etc. Uh, but it was a very very small source. It was three millimeter by five millimeters, and um, I was working on a way to make a bigger cells and to mount it on a substrate that be could be cooled down because the the twenty eight percent cells you could flash it at 200x or 300x, but you cannot put it continuously at 200x or 300. It so would burn down. Yeah. So concentrate exit means uh, concentration. So 200 times yeah. sunlight. Yeah. 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 Sunlight. So yeah. 20 watt per square centimeter. Yeah. And um, and so I was working on the metallization on on double level metal to to be able to solder the cell onto yeah. a cooling substrate. Okay. To to be able to maintain the cells at that concentration for a long time. Yeah. So that was uh, my, my work at Stanford. And I made the first um, uh, mounting ready IBC cells. Okay. And that was 27%. Excellent. Cool. And then and that's the technology that we, we uh, developed at Stanford because Stanford uh, at SunPower, excuse me, SunPower was a concentrator company to start with. And right. The idea was to to make a central receiver, so solar cells on a tower, and surrounded by a field of heliostat yeah. that reflects the, the lights to the tower. Yeah. That was the business plan of uh, SunPower yeah. until we ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you mentioned earlier. Um, in Europe, the focus was on uh, on low cost technology. You always focused on the monocrystalline high efficiency approach. And I mean, fast forward to the presence, one could say you were right, right? Because uh, now nowadays almost every everybody has switched to uh, monocrystalline uh, based technologies. But in between, there was a massive phase where, like the rollout in on the gigawatt scale, was mostly done on on a multicrystalline. Um, material, right? But that has basically been faded out now, totally, or phased out now, totally. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say I was right because um, um, I've said many times that there will be room for monocrystalline and multicrystalline in the market. Yeah, and that was I was wrong there <laughs> because now that it's hundred percent monocrystalline. Uh, but where yeah. I was right is that you were just you nice to... to to the others. Yeah. No, no, no. Because the uh, the amount of energy to make a multicrystalline wafer is, is considerably less than what you need to make a monocrystalline oh, no. yeah. wafer. Um, so I thought that um, um, there will always be room for both, yeah. but we we realized that um, the the cutting cost, making the wafer, slicing the ingot. Mm. Um, became so good with monocrystalline. Now the, the wires is uh, the, the the diamond wires that we use to cut the the wafers out of the ingots are only forty microns in diameter. Yeah. Okay. In in nineteen ninety, it was about two hundred eighty microns. Okay. So the loss. And, and, yeah. 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 It, Material loss has come down. But you yeah. cannot do that with with. Um, I mean, the, the cost of cutting the wafers with uh, multicrystalline, it's uh, it's quite higher than with monocrystalline. And you cannot go down to 40 micron diameter with, uh, uh, for the wires. Yeah. So um, so since we talk about the uh, the early days of in your solar journey and where we are now, so what would be the, let's say, maybe five most important milestones that has led to the massive efficiency increase, but also cost reduction in terms of um, yeah, euros per, per kilowatt. Well, picking five, <laughs> uh, five important close to five is very yeah. difficult because there are thousands, thousands of step, yeah. thousands of little invention that have reduced the price or the cost by yeah. a tenth of a cent. Okay. Yeah. Um, but very often when I, I teach the young uh, engineers in, in China, 
And I asked them, what do you think is the most important um, thing in the improvement of efficiency of solar cells? And they would say, oh, it's per cell, it's the uh, passive added contact, or it's the uh, silicon nitride or aluminum oxide. And I said, yes, but the <coughs> most important thing in my view is people have learned to control contamination. Mm -hmm. Contamination control has been the most important thing in the development of solar cells. I, I remember when people were making solar cells in the 1980s, they were doing it in a very, very dirty environment. There was no clean room. There was no clean room garments. They were smoking next to the, the diffusion tubes. They were handling wafers with bare hands, eating sandwiches uh, in the production line. It was the, the dirtiest place you could imagine. And I was making solar cells in a microelectronic lab with bunny suits, with uh, gloves, with masks, with, uh, uh, with very well controlled environment. And we were measuring lifetime. Nobody was measuring lifetime in the production line, but now everybody does. Everybody mm. has a, a symptom a lifetime measurement tool, right? At that time, we didn't have a symptom uh, lifetime measurement tool, but we were measuring lifetime all the time yeah. to just to make sure to control the, the contamination. That was the most important thing. If we didn't have that, the per cell would still be 12% efficient. Mm. And we wouldn't have a Tomcon uh, cell uh, greater than 13% because the, the, the efficiency would be dominated by recombination in the bulk. Yeah. Now we have almost eliminated the recombination in the bar. We're limited by OG and radiative recombination, and we're limited by the recombination at the, the front or the, 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 the back surface. Yeah. Okay. And if we passivate one surface, then it's the, the other surface that dominates the, uh, the efficiency. Mm. And, and that is absolutely critical. Okay. Contamination control has changed photovoltaics over the last. 10 years or yeah. 15 years, I would say. Uh, still in beginning of 2000, people were still producing uh, cells in quite dirty environment. It yeah. became really clean only in the last, I would say a last uh, decade or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did my master thesis with Andrew Blakers at the Australian National University yeah, and also yeah, yeah. I, I was also in the clean room and um, the most important rule Andrew gave me was that uh, don't talk to the wafer yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah yeah so I I think in the world the, um, myself at the University of Louvain uh, Stanford University and UNSW I think those were the, the three group who understood the cleanliness, the need for clean processing, for high life, what we call it high lifetime processing. Yeah. And that was the first training session of all the engineers I had uh, hired in my groups, either at uh, SunPower or um, at um, Trina Solar or other company. It's the first training class is high lifetime processing. How do you control contamination how do you handle wafers how do you handle uh, chemicals uh, how do you know how how to clean the wafers how to clean uh, solar cells yeah that is the most critical aspect of photovoltaics yeah interesting interesting um so do you have so it's uh, avoiding contamination that like the top 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 and i guess the like young pv engineers they don't they take it for granted, right? The way we uh, do solar cells today. So they might not even think of it. Um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, also technicians who don't have a chance to have the same education that uh, the engineers or scientists or PhD. Um, uh, just a, a few years ago, I still heard from, from production managers saying that, oh, it doesn't matter what you put in the crucible, uh, you still get the same efficiency at the end. Oh. And 
you have to tell no, 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 that's not true. You, you drop, you drop a little piece of uh, of metal in a crucible of multi-crystalline crucible that contains one tons of silicon, and you drop a little piece of sil of uh, metal in it, and you completely destroy the efficiency. Yeah, Andrew Blakers, uh, Martin Green, Dick Swanson. Uh, those are people who understood that concept that we absolutely need to keep contamination to the lowest level. Yeah. And we, we use uh, uh, technique that were developed in microelectronics like uh, gettering and uh, um, uh, oxidation with chlorine, for example, with TCA forming gas anneal, hydrogenation, um, RCA cleaning. Uh, all of those things come from microelectronics. Mm -hmm. uh, and have been in, imported from microelectronics by those groups of Stanford, UNSW, and the University of Louvain. It's, uh, there was absolutely no concept of uh, uh, RCA clean or... Hang on, now you're cut. This uh, presence of in the in photovoltaics before um before it's been imported by uh, stanford and unsw yeah wonderful interesting so uh um so that's the overarching uh subject the the cleaning list in in um, manufacturing would you dare to mention one or two more massive milestones oh yeah 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 there, there yeah. are plenty of uh, of thing to mention i, yeah. I think it's uh, I mean, uh, screen printing evolved tremendously. Being able to make a hundred micron wide fingers to about twenty microns these days. Yeah, so it's, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, to to get um, well, when we're talking about J naught, for example, the the recombination parameters of or so back field. Uh, we're talking reduction from 1,000 femtoamps per square centimeter, centimeters to just one or two or three or less than 10 femtoamps these days. Uh, but that's due to contamination control. Um, and the way we do try it has been a tremendous uh, uh, input and improvement in solar cell processing. Yeah. Uh, so being able to incorporate charge in silicon nitride and make sure they are stable um, to uh, to passivate the surface with uh, inverted or accumulation layers. Yeah. Um, so, and then after that, that's silicon nitride with positive charge, and then al aluminum oxide with negative charge has been the uh, the next uh, important step. Um, yeah, it's there are a lot of uh, very very small improvements, and yeah. it's difficult to to mention those and not mention all the other one. Yeah, but excellent. Thank, thanks for the uh, at least for your uh, from the top of your head uh, <laughs> top top three or four um, uh, milestones in in PV technology. So um, what do you do is so, so you now the uh, terawatt man. Uh, today you're looking when you look forward. Your your I would say your key mission is now to think about um, how does uh, manufacturing look like? How does in an in industry look like? How does the supply chain look like um, when we have uh, when you reach like a terawatt annual production volume? Right. Just for our listeners. Um, so the the annual production capacity of PV solar cells right now is, uh, yeah, let's say around 200, 200 gigawatts a year. Um, yeah, so pro probably in 2022, uh, we will produce more than 250 gigawatts. 250 gigawatts, yeah. What, yeah, the, we just passed a very important milestone. We, yeah. uh, we counted that the cumulative capacity of PV has reached one terawatt. Just yeah. the beginning of this year, um, probably in February, probably in March. Some people say it's probably will be in June, but it doesn't really matter. We 
reach a very important milestone, yeah. one terawatt of PV, and that represents about 5% of the world's uh, generated electricity. Yeah. Now, what we've seen over the last 40 years is the, um, uh, the production and the cumulative capacity of PV has been a, a growing exponential and uh, we have roughly an average a doubling of the capacity and a doubling of the annual production every three years. Mm. And if you look at, uh, if you look in a, a logarithm plot, you see two, those two straight lines. One is the annual production and one is the cumulative production, of course, with little variation uh, from year to year, but it's, almost a straight line showing that it's it's been an exponential growth function for the the, the last 40 years mm. the the gap between those two uh, lines are roughly about four years so when when you say that we have a, a reach a threshold of cumulative capacity of one terawatt it means that in roughly about four years or five years we'll reach a one terawatt annual production mm. That is huge. And I, I think the, the PV industry at, at a very important juncture, I would say it's not business as usual. Mm. Before we were trying to reduce cost and improve reliability. Then after that, we, we focus on, on efficiency, trying to improve efficiency. And that's what we're still doing. Now we need to add another aspect to it, sustainability we cannot afford to develop technology that will not be sustainable when we reach a terawatt of annual production or two terawatts or three terawatts of annual production. Yeah. Okay, and it goes very quickly. It took 60 years to install the first 500 gigawatts mm -hmm. and just four years to install the next half terawatt. Yeah. Okay. And it will take another four years to install the next terawatt, yeah. right? And things are going so fast. We're using a very large quantities of silver. And if everybody switched to ATO Junction, we won't be able to do it because they won't, they won't be enough indium. Mm. And they won't be enough bismuth. Bismuth is used for interconnecting the uh, heterojunction solar cells because we cannot do a high temperature soldering with uh, amorphous silicon. Mm. So we limit it to about 200 degrees C. So we got tin bismuth and, so, um, and we use indium as a TCO on each side of the solar cell. Yeah. So that's not sustainable. And for, if we look just for the silver, right now we use about 15 milligrams per watt, which means that we're using roughly about 10% of the overall production of, um, of silver in the world, more than 10%. Mm -hmm. And if we go to a terawatt or 1.5 terawatts per year, which is very soon, we'll use 100%. Right, and we cannot continue this way. So, so we need to make sure that everything we do in terms of technology development, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of uh, uh, growth in in, uh, in production volume, we need to make sure we do it sustainably. Yeah. Um, just to make sure we don't uh, or everybody's on on the same page here. How how do you define sustainability right um yeah you, i think you you have a, a good point there's many aspects of sustainability yeah number one we need to make sure that we can grow financially right so we we need to make sure that we don't have to borrow money all the time to to build new factories mm. okay and for the first time in history the pv industry is capable to grow and then uh, with like... with the earning it generates. All right, the, so the from, the, from the own cash flow. All right, yeah. for his own cash flow. Yes, 
Yeah. Okay. And that's quite new in the in the PV industry. So it was not the case uh, twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, we the, twenty years ago, the PV industry had to borrow money all the time to to grow and build new factories. And then yeah. when they could not borrow, they will, they went bankrupt. Yeah. Um, and it's it's not the case anymore. All right. So uh, that's the, the other f- thing. Financial stabi- third, sustainability. That's the financial yeah. sustainability. Yeah. The other one is the the energy sustainability. You need need to make sure that you don't grow faster than your energy payback time allows you so if it takes mm. 10 years okay <laughs> to pay back the energy you consume to make the panels you cannot grow more than 10 percent per year yeah right it, yeah. because if you do you keep increasing the uh, primary primary energy demand yeah so these days the energy payback time of a panel is in the range of one year so we can grow 100 percent per year if we need to Okay, so energy sustainability tick, we, yeah. we can do that. And that was not the case 20 years ago, 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Um, the, um, then there's the, the material sustainability. Uh, we, we need to make sure that the, the material we consume to make the solar cell, not only the material that's in the, embedded in the solar cell, but also the water, the, um, the, uh, the CO2 emissions, the, uh, the wastewater that we generate, et cetera, all of that needs to be sustainable. Mm. Okay, so if we look, to think about a CO2 emission is the same thing as energy. We need to have a CO2 payback time. Okay, yeah. so yeah. if we, if we save CO2 by implementing uh, PV panels or PV systems in the world, we need to make sure that quickly it pays back the CO2 you consume to, uh, that you consume to generate the electricity or other material that you need to manufacture the panel. Yeah. But the biggest problem these days is silver. Yeah. And, and that's, is is the same problem although it's more acute for uh for topcon and Etor junction but we use too much silver we need to reduce silver to less than five milligrams per watt yeah okay where, so the, the, where are we today that it's about for perk we are roughly about the best best in class perk production line use about 15 milligrams per watt okay so we need to reduce that at least by a factor of three, yeah. if not eliminating completely. Uh, for Topcon, um, we use about 50% more than PERC. And the reason it's because you need silver on both sides uh, mm-hmm. for the Topcon. Although on the front, it's, a, it's, a re- it's aluminum silver paste. It's not pure silver. And then for it or junction, you use more than twice the amount of perk. So you have about 30 milligrams per, per watt. Yeah. And we need to go down to less than five. To be, uh, to have sustainable solar cell production on a terawatt scale, you see, and, and, and beyond, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so there are different scenarios for uh, net zero, um, emission so for for transitioning from where we are today to a net zero co2 emission there are different scenarios the one i like best is a hundred percent renewable all the other one assume that we could store the the co2 uh, capture and store it and sequest the the co2 and i have some doubt that will be possible yeah because it hasn't been proven technology in a very large scale. Yeah. And if you s- store the CO2, you need to store it forever, right? Mm. So Tr- um, Tricky. Yeah, tricky. And um, so the only one that I consider as uh, viable is 100% renewable. Yeah. Um, and that means that we need to deploy about 70 terawatts by 2050. 70 terawatts of, to, 
of PV. Of PV. Of and, PV. Uh, yeah. and, um, then, and then about 40 terawatt of, um, of wind, and then you have pump hydros for storage, and you have also the existing hydros, um, and you have a bit of biomass. Um, but PV becomes, well, PV is king. It's the one that allows you to, to, uh, to grow to that level. Uh, and the advantage of PV, you could install it anywhere in the world. Absolutely anywhere in the world you could install PV, which is not the same for wind or other uh, technologies. Yeah. And you could uh, deploy at any scale. You could put it PV at 10 watts or to 10 gigawatts. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so to get 70 terawatt of PV by 2050, there's different ways to do it. You could grow very quickly right now and then stabilize it. Or you could grow slower, but if you grow slower, you have to grow to a very, very high level of annual production, like 10 terawatts per year. Yeah. And then when you reach 2015, the problem is that <laughs> you don't need PV anymore and you're gonna kill the industry because you have major downturn. So that's why you wouldn't reach it, right? Because everybody would be scared of building new factories just before the the end of the the boom, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's we need what we need to do, and what I tell people: the next ten years will be absolutely decisive. We need to keep growing at twenty five percent per year, even thirty percent if we can. Yeah. The industry can. The problem is not manufacturing. The problem is not growth of the industry. It's not, the problem is sustainability and mm. integration. Integration of, of what? Of? of PV. Well, I mean, you need, um, you need to have the demand for, for PV. You cannot install photovoltaic panels and have no demand or no interconnection, you need transmission line, you need storage, ah, you, okay, need, okay. Yeah. You, you need people to use that electricity, you need to electrify the entire energy economy. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, pumped hydro for, for storage, right? I mean, obviously, um, and this is what many people are concerned about is uh, the wind uh, doesn't shine, uh, doesn't blow day and night, and uh, obviously the sun definitely doesn't shine at night. Is that the way to go, pumped hydro, or for 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 storage, or do you see other technologies? Oh, there are plenty of technologies, and I think pump yeah. hydro is great, but it's not the solution. Yeah. There are um, depending. Um, I mean, in the energy business, it's never been the case where one technology covers all the needs. Yeah, we need diversification. Yeah. So we need PV, wind, and hydro, and biomass. And for storage, we need batteries, we need pump hydros, we need compressed air, uh, and we need uh, thermal storage. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the other day, I, I was on LinkedIn, and somebody mentioned, um, well, somebody was talking about 100% uh, renewable, etc. cetera. Um, and somebody says, uh, well, I hope that you don't, you're not afraid to have a cold shower during the night. And I'm thinking, this guy never heard about hot water tank. Yeah, <laughs> that's the easy way so to do it. Yeah. There's a, a diversity of storage media that we need, and, and it could be thermal. It uh -huh. could be, um, I mean, if you need to, um, to heat or cool your house, and the first things you do, it's make sure you have a good thermal mass in your house, right? Yeah. So, so you heat that thermal mass or you cool that thermal mass to make sure that the house is constant. Yeah. Or a tank. So you could have a shower at night. Um, my house in, in Australia uh, is 100% powered by PV and I have no problem. <laughs> 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 I, I, there's absolutely no CO2 emitted from my house except when we open a bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we cook with electricity, even the barbecue is electric, the car is electric. Um, 
All right, so you already managed your CO2 footprint. Excellent. So um, you run a company that's, you're basically self-employed now um, uh, and you run under the name MROC um, Limited. Sure. Um, I just Googled MROC, so I was wondering how, how did you come up with that name? Because uh, in, in German, the German Wikipedia says it's a type of chicken um, from the US, which is very productive uh, in terms of eggs. Um, Excellent. Were you, were, you, were you thinking of that? <laughs> you want to be very I didn't know that. Just Thompson, like that chicken. I didn't know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, no, it just, Amrock just came from my name and my wife's name. Okay. Uh, my wife is Anne Marie, and that's AM. And rock is the English uh, translation of care. So, uh, of pure, uh, yeah. it just I'm rock became natural and it sounds great. So, uh, um, that's how it came. All right. Maybe you uh, can use the, the chicken as your new logo or so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Just, just check out uh, German Wikipedia. Anyhow, so um, just, just tell us what do you do as a you know, as a profession these days, um, you, you, your consultant, who are your customers? What do you, what kind of service do you provide? Well, I, I, I do quite a bit of work with, um, with a few companies. Um, yeah. I, I usually don't, don't take a short-term uh, consulting contract because uh, that's, I'm busy enough with, uh, with what I do with the other companies. So I still work with uh, Trina Solar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a part-time chief scientist, um, I am also on the board of, uh, of two companies uh, that are uh, active in PV. So one is Oxford PV, the other one is uh, BT Imaging in Sydney. Uh, so one is, like you mentioned, uh, a, a perovskite silicon tandem uh, technology developer. And, and the other one is a uh, company in Sydney, uh, making characterization tools for the PV industry. Yeah. Um, I'm also advisor of a, a few other companies, um, uh, not officially a director, uh, but uh, just an advisor to, to them, to some startups that are PV okay. related. And I try to, to keep all of uh, those uh, um, companies um, far away in terms of technology. So there is no uh, conflict of interest or risk of IP right. leakage. Okay. And then the rest of my time is um, is volunteering um, at the university as adjunct professor, or um, organizing conference, or reviewing manuscripts, um, yeah. and helping uh, young engineers and uh, and um, young companies, uh, startup companies. But yeah. um, that's what I do, and I, I keep me hundred percent busy with all that. So no need to call you. You're booked out. Um. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Do you have a waiting list? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you talked about um, um, young engineers. Um, throughout your career, you must have hired uh, many, many people. And uh, so we, we switch topic a little bit. So how, how do you pick talent? So this must have been a very important aspect to uh, achieve all those fantastic uh, engineering and scientific results that you that you and your team have have achieved right and and hiring getting the right people into the team is a essential part it's yeah. not just about the idea but it's all the also about the uh, the people right the interaction the skills the the character so how do you what, what i'm i'm interested in uh, in engineers uh, i'm hired uh, or scientists researcher what i'm in interested in is to see the way they think and how the way they they uh, um, they can challenge a, a new problem that's in interviewing sorry so you were, uh, sorry candidate. yeah sorry you were cut again so uh okay. here you, you want to yeah please re, uh, yeah what repeat yeah. yes so I've been known to be uh, a difficult interviewer, yeah. uh, asking difficult questions. So I often I put the uh, the new candidates in front of a board and ask him a problem that is outside of his 
area of competence. Uh -huh. uh, so for example, you, you would have the uh, uh, semiconductor engineers, and I would ask, uh, for example, a little problem with uh, pumping water from a reservoir, for example, and to, to evaluate the dimensioning of the pump or the tubes or the pipes, etc. cetera. Um, not necessarily having the exact answer, but I want to know how he thinks about a problem. Yeah. Um, and um, also I would ask, I, I was always looking for people who understand device physics, but also like to work in the lab and make solar cells. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I would ask um, device physics questions, um, relatively simple, um, because not everybody is expert in device physics, but uh, uh, I want to make sure that uh, the engineer at least have a, a knowledge about, uh, about physics of semiconductor. And then often I would ask if they like cooking. Cooking, okay. <laughs> cooking. And they, they would look at me as, is that serious? Is that a serious question? And um, what I found out is that the best process engineers are people who like cooking in the kitchen. They like cooking, taste, the sauce, etc. That's how you, no, it's not always true. I'm, I'm not, if the guy says, no, I don't like cooking, or the, the, the woman says, uh, I don't like cooking, I don't reject necessarily. But yeah. uh, it was a, a question that I like to ask people. Excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, you, you've worked together with great people and uh, over the years um, you, you started out as an, as an engineer but you became a manager group leader um, uh, and uh, so how did you develop that skill was there a role model or a book you read that that helped you a lot in becoming a better manager and, and leader well I always thought that a, a good manager need to have uh, three fundamental qualities. Uh -huh. Number one, they need to know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay. It's a skill. Um, yeah. Yeah. No bullshit. No, yeah. uh, um, they, they need to be able to do the work themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? They need to know well, we, we're talking um, about solar cells. We, a good manager needs to be somebody experienced in, in PV. The, the second thing is that they need to work hard. As much as I do, as much as uh, other people, as much as their direct report. And then the third quality needs to be a good human being. So how, how do you pick how do you how do you judge a uh, yeah how do you find how would you define that <laughs> uh, i i think it's pretty obvious no it's when obvious. you work with someone okay it's pretty obvious if that person is a good human being or not if okay if uh, if you have a, a family issue or kid issue or or sickness and you ask your boss can i have a day off yeah and if the uh the well-being of the person is more important than the, uh, uh, the the revenue of the company. I think you could judge that this person is a good human being. Excellent, excellent. Um, so that that's three qualities, and and then the rest is um, yeah, it's a little bit um, uh, secondary. But the, the three fundamental quality of a good good manager are those three. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, my final question always is, and, and you mentioned it a little bit, but maybe you can uh, come back to that again, is uh, what is required to get solar to the next level? So now that we have achieved one terawatt, mm -hmm. um, in a nutshell, how, what is required to bring us, to get us to 100% renewables, uh, a larger portion of solar? Well, I, I already mentioned sustainability um, yeah. that we need to add to the condition for um, for PV. 
So we know already that the cost has to be low and continue to come down. We need to make sure that the reliability is good. So the panel will survive 25 years, 30 years, maybe 50 years. We're talking about 50 years yeah. or so, but the, in, uh, uh, I, I've seen recently that uh, power plants these days, the average lifetime of a power plant is about 32 years. 32. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty good. Um, yeah. Probably not everywhere. There, there are some climates that are very difficult, like tropical climates, are very difficult. Yeah. Um, but we need to add sustainability. We need to make sure about sustainable technology. Yeah. Now the the main challenge that we are facing is integration. Can can the world install? multi terawatt per year when we, yeah. we know we can produce it yeah i'm i'm certain we can produce it so with the, the, the industry can grow to yeah. that level the sustainability issue material sustainability we're working on it we'll solve the problem the, yeah. the silver problem the indian problem the uh, the bismuth problem and we'll solve all solve all of that I'm not sure that we'll be able to deploy fast enough because we need a transmission line, we need interconnection, we need storage, we need electrification of the world. Mm. And um, these days, yeah, sorry, you're, you're cut again. Hold the speech. <laughs> Energy, right? So, sorry, you were cut again. Um, you, you're saying uh, these days. Um, yeah, electricity yeah. is only 20 or 25 percent of the uh, the world consumption of energy. A, a, yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. we need to electrify. Because so we, 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 we're driving energy. cars and we, yeah. we're driving cars and we uh, we use petrol. We cook and we use gas. We eat the building and we use gases. And in industry, we use coal for making steel or yeah. even to make silicon. Right, yeah. and uh, and we use petrol for the for the chemistry for for plastic etc. So we need to transform all of that with electricity, total electricity that will that will power directly or indirectly to, for example, uh, synthetic fuels yeah. or to uh, um, other way to to transport energy to power the entire energy economy. Yeah. And so electric is an issue. Interconnecting the, um, uh, the, the communities, the, the cities, the uh, countries to transport energy. So, so we need uh, east-west transmission line to do daily shift of energy, right? Yeah, yeah. And when it when it's dark in in Sydney, there's still light in Perth in Australia, and you could transport the energy on the other side, right? Yeah. And we need north and south transmission lines because, for example, in Germany, you have a lot of wind in the winter in the north, and you need to transport that in the south, and yeah. then you have sun in the summer, and you need to transport that to the north, right? Yeah, yeah. So we need transmission line, and then we need storage. And we talk there are different ways of storing the energy. It could be thermal, it could be compressed air, it could be um, uh, uh, chemical in the batteries, or it could be um, uh, uh, in pump hydro, for example, in uh, water, so uh, cinetic and uh, potential energy. Um, all of that needs to be installed at the same time as we install. PV. Yeah, we need yeah. electric cars. We need electric bus. We need to electrify all the trains. What do we do with the, the boats? We need to convert boats from petrol to ammonia, for example. And ammonia would be generated from hydrogen that will be produced from green electricity. Yeah. All of that new energy economy needs to be put in place. Yeah. And that will be difficult. Yeah. Plenty, plenty to be done. Um, yeah. Plenty to be done for for this and 
I guess also the next generation of, of engineers and, uh, and of course, businessmen. Hey, Pierre, it's been wonderful um, to uh, look back and uh, look into, into the future together with you. Um, all the best. Enjoy the rest, the remaining days in your holidays in Spain. That's where you are now. Yeah. And uh, hope to see you soon at some conference workshop. I guess latest will be Milano at the World Conference in, in Italy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely will be there at the World Conference in Milan. Um, it was great talking to you, Torsten. It was yeah. great. I, I hope I, I, uh, I didn't talk too large and too, <laughs> too much. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's some space yeah. for your questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, Torsten. See you soon. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.